Welcome to STEMiverse podcast episode 49. In this episode, Peter talks with Andra Key. Andra is the managing director of Silicon Valley Robotics, an industry group supporting innovation and commercialization of robotics technologies. Andra is also founder of Robot Launch, global robotics startup competition, co-founder of Robot Garden Hackerspace, mentor at Hardware Accelerators, and a startup advisor and investor with a strong interest in commercializing socially positive robotics and artificial intelligence. This is Stemivis podcast episode 49. Stemivis is a podcast produced by Tech Explorations. Our mission is to help educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. Whether you are a professional or casual teacher teaching in a classroom or a parent or caretaker teaching at home, this podcast brings you the knowledge and experiences of practitioners, academics, entrepreneurs, and lifelong learners who are passionate about education and strive every day to help our children prepare for life in a world of radical change and why not abundance. Hello, Andra. Thank you for joining us on STEMiverse Podcast. How are you today? I'm fine and it's a pleasure to be here. So whereabouts are you? Just uh, put yourself oh. on the <laughs> on earth. At the moment, I'm in a comfy chair in a town called Pleasanton, which is in California. Mm. And it's in the Silicon Valley, San Francisco area. It's a very pleasant town. It lives up to its name. And basically, it's where everybody that can't afford to live right in the heart of Silicon Valley lives and, you know, you've got space to have children and uh, yeah, swing a cat. <laughs> it is. Uh, so Silicon Valley in particular, San Francisco, they are kind of expensive, um, they're kind of like Sydney, isn't it? And then you've got the suburbs around and you are in one of those. Well, yes, we came from Sydney and we came from the inner city in Sydney, in right. fact. Uh, so we were able to bring up a family in Sydney, but I do think that Sydney is a more attractive city. The most busy areas of Silicon Valley and San Francisco are not actually that appealing either mm. to mm. live in, and that's why I say Pleasanton does really live up to its name. It's a much more, there's a lot of trees around, there's, you know, a beautiful view when you look out, whereas the first day I got off the plane from Sydney, which was back at the start of 2011, and I knew we had to find somewhere to live, I drove up and down the freeways and I thought, this is the most horrible place anywhere. <laughs> it's just, it's flat, it's grey, it's gridlock traffic, and that really is the reality of yeah. a lot of the daytime in Silicon Valley. But the rest of what the environment offers is fantastic. And when you say the rest, you, you talk about people, right? And what people do. The people, what people do and the way. I went over very, very proud of what we do in Australia and how we do it. And I still, you know, I feel like being an Australian overseas, I don't need to drink the Kool-Aid, as it were. I don't need to be, you know, defensively defending everything American. I get to be critical and I get to say, well, you know, there are actually things in Australia that we do much better, mm. and there are quite a few. But in terms of entrepreneurship and in terms of emerging technologies in robotics and AI, right now Silicon Valley is the most interesting place in the world to be. Yeah. Well, let's get into it. Um, I'd like to take a step back and uh, learn a few things about you. Uh, obviously, you uh, were introduced to me by Sue, your sister, Sue Key, who uh, we did an interview and it's published as episode 40, maybe a couple of months ago. It was a very interesting conversation. I've got a few questions in relation to that for you <laughs> this time around. So uh, it seems like... Uh, uh, robotics run in the family. Could you take us back in your life, uh, even perhaps before 2011 when uh, you went to the United States and tell us uh, a bit about your background? And you, you can go through the short uh, version of the story, of course, and tell us how all that led you to where you are now. And of course, what are you doing now and what are you doing in Silicon Valley? Okay, well, it's a very circular story, and I think perhaps that's one of the key things. 
I ruled out a lot of STEM careers when I was growing up because I didn't fit the patterns and they didn't seem as interesting. And then I felt that I'd lost those opportunities. Now, I haven't. I just have taken a different pathway to get there. So to go even further back, Sue and I, our father was an astrophysicist. He was the Australian NASA correspondent. We visited radio telescopes on our holidays and we travelled a bit with him to space launches. And Mm. certainly as a young girl, I was building rockets and electronics equipment for his physics lab. And I was used to being considered as good as one of his undergraduate students. But I also became aware that the first thing people would say is, that's unusual for a girl. (laughs) And in many ways, that dilemma of wanting to do something, but instead of being praised for doing it well, I was always praised for doing it well for a girl. Mm -hmm. And the difference for me became in many ways the most fascinating thing. How could it be unusual for a girl? Why was that so? Um, What would I have to do to change that? You know, uh, as a young competitive um, kid, I wanted to be the best, not just good for a girl. Uh, So it felt like I was being, you know, kept away from competing on a fair field. And, of course, one of those things is around about 10-year-old. I have the same story that Hillary Clinton and many other women I can point to did. We wrote to NASA and we were told that no, women couldn't become astronauts. (laughs) They um, had this kind of sideways out, which was, well, we'll take you as long as you're an Air Force test pilot. And, of course, the Air Force was far more like, yeah, no, not women, no. And... You know, I decided as a more rebellious teenager that I actually liked more creative technologies anyway, and I went into film and television. Mm. I did a bit of performing, I did a bit of writing, and I did a very technical traineeship with the ABC and a degree in communications at University of Technology in Sydney. And, of course, what I realised is while I liked the creative aspects of film and television and radio, for that matter, I also really enjoyed playing with the technology. And film and television is, next to NASA, one of the best places for I- indulging yourself with a lot of very cool technology. Uh, of course, this makes sense now, uh, years later when I'm trying to explain how I went from film and television to robots. But yep. in between, I had children and I went through that I can only work part-time stage that many women... Yeah. Raise kids feel obliged to take mm. while you have children. And I became very interested in providing my children with the best possible education, future-proofing them. And so robotics and AI came back as one of the areas I'd always been really interested in, but thought that, you know, I thought it was too late for me to have a career in that field. You know, like being an astronaut, you had to have declared science as your major early on and kind of stuck to it. But What I found is that we couldn't get science teachers to run enough of the kids' activities, so I stepped in. At this point, uh, before you make the jump into robotics, you are working at the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, if I understand right, and you are a film editor, a multimedia artist. Is that correct? And at, at that point... Do you believe that you are basically settled for a career before you decide that you need to do something in robotics? Uh, I thought I was settled in film and television, yes. But I also left the ABC when they were introducing digital technologies and changing the hours that they expected everyone to work oh, and not kids providing as well. childcare yep. for those mm-hmm. because I had my first child. And while I could do a lot to work with a child in terms of arranging my life and schedule very creatively, depending on my mother to bail me out. (laughs) The fact that institutionally they were bringing in a practice of having rolling shifts over a 24-hour period, yet having limited hours childcare, it just, it made me very angry. A number of people at the ABC protested that and some of us quit over that. But... For me, it was certainly a final blow. 
for those listeners that are not familiar with the ABC, that's the public broadcaster in Australia. So it's like BBC in the UK. It's very similar. And they gave me a great training in film and television technologies, which was fantastic. Before we move on, I just wanted to explore your site as an artist since uh, I was looking at your your bio and uh, you did mention that you were a multimedia artist, maybe you still are. Can you tell us what that was like? And uh, I want to have a look at that because I want to see how that is influencing your work since in robotics and like in high tech. I don't really see myself as a practitioner these days because I do believe you've got to devote a lot of time to being an artist. Mm -hmm. Being an artist is more or less a full-time thing. And so, you know, for the last 10 or more years, I would call myself more of a maker. And I think Mm -hmm. being a maker is a nice way to address somebody who occasionally has splurges of building things and creating things, but isn't trying to do it as their primary career. Right. Do you think that what you did back then as a film editor, multimedia artist, and even a writer, obviously, because that was part of what you were doing, uh, rubbed off in a way? Uh, Are there any principles and skills that uh, you picked up then or you developed that you are still using and you feel that are important in your everyday professional, even like day-to-day personal life? I think we learn all the time. So... I don't think that there's qualitatively anything different between what I've learned in art, um, what I've learned in sport and what I've learned in science. But being open to having all of those experiences and treating them on a more or less equal basis, I feel like if you only go through the science world, then you create a hierarchical system of judging. And I'm not saying I'm opposed to scientific method or validating hypotheses, but I prioritize what it is to be human, which means accepting that the majority of the way that we're human is not actually rational Mm -hmm. and can't be covered by science. So Science is great, but it's a limited part of the world. Whereas sometimes people look at science and say, well, it's describing the physical world around us and the rules of physics, and therefore it kind of trumps everything. But I think that means that they don't focus on how irrational and complex we are Mm. as people. And that comes out when you work in more, say, artistic environments, Particularly, yes. In art, people feel a much greater openness to somebody else's explanation of who they are, what they mean, and why they mean that. Whereas once we get more text-based, again, we tend to start to refine it and prioritise and create hierarchies of what's important and what's not. I mean, one day when an artist said to me that the purpose of art was to express emotion. And perhaps that's a common view, but I'd never heard someone say that. And it made me reconsider both their practice and many other things around me. And I thought, if art really is an expression of emotion, then it fits into a completely different function than I'd thought about it. And I use this example not because I think it's a finite position, but just to say that perhaps learning how to think artistically is a way of thinking dynamically in a changing environment, which I think is a very important skill that has helped me a lot with science, with technology, and with the expression of technology in the real world, which, you know, you could call commercialising. I think it's a very equivalent role. I find we have a lot of our guests in the past as well. Uh, Nurit Basha is one of them. Her episode isn't published yet, but it will be. She's an artist. And we we spent a bit of time talking about this very topic. And um, we came to the conclusion that art is uh, 
extremely important for anyone, including especially people that do science and engineering, because it, it's just another, I suppose, crazy method for viewing reality from a different perspective. And uh, putting a bit of randomness in it as well helps find additional solutions like t to problems. That's what engineers do, for example, fixing problems, but looking them from looking at those problems from a different perspective, that of the artist, who knows what kind of possible solutions are revealed. So I always want to explore that aspect of, of our guests as well. So I'd like to go back to your story. So you're now at the ABC, that these changes at the corporation happen and uh, you've got kids that you need to look after as well and you decide to future-proof them as well. And robotics is uh, a great way of doing that. Can you tell us what happens next? How do you actually get into being a robotics person? Curiosity. There's one key skill that I have that I think has taken me wherever I go that is both good and bad, and it's curiosity. If you are interested in learning something new, then it means that you're willing to go and speak to someone or pick up a book or consider going to study something. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I did was go back to university when more of my children were around school age. Mm -hmm. And that gave me, you know, a little bit of free time. Now, every working parent here is going to chuckle because I say it gave me free time. And I was working as well as bringing up children. But when they went to school, there was a qualitative difference and quantitative difference in the amount of energy and time I had to put into things. So I really felt like on top of work, I could do with some more mind food. Mm. And uh, so I wanted to kind of refocus myself on what was happening in robotics and understanding it in technology. And I have to say that at that time, I did not imagine a career coming out of it that was not going to be more or less teaching robotics in society, acting as a kind of translator between mm. roboticists and, or robotics and people that didn't know much about robotics or running classes for people who wanted to learn more about robotics but weren't robotics engineers yeah. themselves. That kind of um, view from the outside. What I didn't realise is that the broad understanding of robotics that I had and the curiosity that, um, you know, I always come with put me pretty much into the middle of what was about to become the most uh, largest and most innovative sector of uh, robotics in the world. And there wasn't anybody else able to take on creating an organisation to uh, represent the companies that were doing this robotics and to understand enough about it to see how this needed to be positioned in terms of fitting in with everything from manufacturing to the politics of the situation, understanding how robotics would relate to labor law, for example. So there's quite a few things happening then. So your drive, I suppose, is curiosity. Your why is to, if I understand right, help your children and future-proof your children. So you wanted to do something about them. And then you decided to do that in a business way, in a market-driven way. Uh, you mentioned that you wanted to bring companies that do robotics together, explain robotics to people that don't quite understand them. Is that the context at which you're working or in which you're working at the moment? Uh, I think there's really kind of the before and the after, mm -hmm. the Australian version and the Silicon Valley version. Are you still in And Australia? they've turned into very different things. So... The Australian version involved me running science clubs mm -hmm. and a before and after school care program, which, um, you know, sometimes I thought I was just a frustrated teacher. And, yeah. <laughs> but I enjoyed the fun aspects, you know, like let's, let's play games with technology, let's integrate sport and art and technology. So I've always had a strong interest in developing a kind of holistic practice around technology, not mm -hmm. seeing it only for its own sake. But there were two things really that came up during the years that I was running 
uh, science clubs and robotics uh, competitions and after school sports programs as well is that I was dealing with issues of gender, mm-hmm. both within things like the robotics competitions and within things like the soccer teams that I was managing in Sydney. So I got involved with really trying to change the gender ratio and there was a real parallel between the way the gender ratios would happen without intervention and the changes that you could make if you intervened in the right way at the right times. And, you know, our club ended up with a very, very large and active girls program for soccer and we ended up with some female teams in robotics that performed very, very well. The girls were trying to get a Google scholarship, but I was bribing them to to do it. What they told me afterwards and what their parents said to me is that, you know, one of the parents said, I can't thank you enough. All she wanted was a goat for Christmas before, and this is in the middle of Sydney, and she said, and now she wants a robot kit. (laughs) You know, that, that was one of the things. And just to see girls that had written, and this is girls at the age of like 11 years old, to see them becoming really engaged with robotics and setting themselves up to become engineers or product designers or project managers. You know, I thought that was a wonderful thing. Was there one, one or two, say, key aspects of the work you did with those girls that helped them, you know, move towards engineering? Uh, in, in a way, I'm not sure if I'm using the right word here, but in a way, uh, break these stereotypes from goats going to robots? Right. Um, well, one of the things was I had a relationship with the teacher <coughs> where we could talk a little bit and I was familiar enough with the kids at school. So I had a bit of an idea about their personalities. So between talking to the teacher and what I knew, we already figured that there was a group of girls that were potentials. But when we announced at the assembly that I would be running a robotics club, 40 hands shot up in the air (laughs) and there were only a couple of girls' hands and they put their hands down pretty quick when they saw that it had become a boy's thing. So I talked to the teacher about that and she agreed with me that there were definitely girls that she thought would be interested, that I thought would be interested, who clearly felt that the rest of the experience no longer appealed to them. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, then what we do is we change that experience. We do a girls only robotics team and club and they meet separately or, you know, we do what we can so that they enjoy it. And Do you know, this is an argument that I heard in soccer from boys' parents all the time when I would create a mixed team. They would come to me and they'd say, oh, but he wanted to play with his friends. This isn't fair on him. And I thought, you know, none of you ever complained when girls were split up and dropped into a team here and a team there. No one said, hey, this isn't fair on the girls. They need to play with a friend. Everybody just said, look, if the girls want to play soccer or football, then they just have to deal with it. (laughs) Yes. So what I did is I learned from one side and I applied that in the other side. And I said, well, they need to bring their friends with them. So yeah. that's perhaps the key thing in creating teams and clubs. So I made sure that we had groups of friends. And it didn't mean that you had to do all boys and all girls, but we had to establish that first. And then it was more comfortable so to the create environment teams and- the first thing is the environment, get the environment right so that the girls feel safe and that they're not you know, criticised for doing what might be perceived as a boys' activity. Well, I think even beyond that, it mm. wasn't that they wanted, that they were afraid of criticism. These were feisty girls. It's just they weren't friends with the boys. Yeah. So the year below, we had a cluster of very smart kids that was more evenly matched. And, you know, there were a couple of girls, a couple of boys, and it didn't matter which of them put their hands up. Mm -hmm. They looked across Mm -hmm. and they went, oh, they're my mates. I can stay together. So we had a mixed team with that group. What about the technology? Um, So I suppose uh, we are looking now at before 2010 or 2011, uh, still the technology that we've got today in the robotics area is quite different to what was available back then. 
Can you tell us a bit Ooh, about... Oh, I don't think uh, so. No, Honestly, yep. not. It was mind storms, basically. Mind storms, yeah. So, uh, you know, when I was doing this, it was just after the days of the yellow brick, if anyone's been doing mm-hmm. mind storms for a long time. And it was the start of the grey brick for mind storms. Mm-hmm. And they're still doing a fairly similar brick. I mean, the c- capabilities have changed. We started to get things like, you know, a Bluetooth capabilities, not needing to connect cables, mm. uh, better sensors. But the Lego environment itself in terms of the code environment and the general configuration is pretty much the same. Yeah. One of the things that we do have in Australia that was great is the Robo Cup competition, which I think is the best robotics competition in the world. It's a global competition and it goes all the way from primary school level up to university level. And I've been very involved in both the first competitions and the VEX competitions in mm-hmm. America because RoboCup is just not popular. And you tend to have to do the competitions that are strong in your region. Otherwise, you just, you know, you don't have other teams to compete with. So I've experienced more and I do think still that RoboCup is the best around. Uh, why is competition important? And I'm saying that because Back uh, maybe about a year ago, we had an interview with, um, back in episode 21 and 22, we had an interview with Lyle Grant, who is uh, a teacher doing competitive robotics. So we spent a bit of time talking about you know, why competition is important and uh, what kind of educational outcomes uh, you get in a competitive environment. Could you talk a little bit about you know, your experience in getting students to compete against other students in the space of robotics? Yes. Now, I will say that it's always a very, very friendly competition. Mm -hmm. And the students love it. The parents love it even more. And I think the principals love it even more so. What it does is it generates photos. It generates like a scoreline. So it's a story that you can tell. And it generates, you know, something to be proud of. It goes in the school newsletter. Otherwise, I think that the robotics club just kind of sits out there and it's a little bit lonesome. So competitions, I think, have got great impact. In terms of the children... What I found is that kids would be just as happy working on the kits and the challenges without the competition, up to a degree. What the competition did was it introduced project management and timing Mm -hmm. to them and also negotiation because otherwise it was play. And the dominant players would just hang on to it and play with it their way. Yeah. But when they had to produce something within a certain time frame, it allowed others to help steer what was happening. And in many ways, that was the biggest challenge for a lot of the kids. We've had kids pulling robots apart in the middle of competition because they wanted to rebuild it differently. Mm. And, of course, they were crippling the team and, you know, having to deal with that. So we had really strong kind of conflict almost between the kids that just wanted to keep building and the Uh, ones that were able to see that there was a deadline, there was a project, there was something they had to complete. I think they did manage just to, well, no, we've had a few different experiences. In one it worked and in one it certainly didn't. But that's an experience as well. (laughs) Yeah. uh, I found as uh, as someone trying to guide them to be their mentor and coach, I thought that the time management and group management were a really good learning part from it. Very interesting you say that uh, right after Lael, uh, we did an interview with a couple of his students. So we've got that documented in STEMiverse episode 22. And we asked the students what was the most valuable experience or skill that they got out of participating in competitive robotics. And they said the ability to work in a team and uh, under, under some pressure, competitive pressure. I guess there's nothing that unites a team, uh, team members together other than the objective of winning a competition and going through the various stages. And those kids also traveled uh, into, uh, to the United States and uh, they've gone to China as well, participating in competitions. And that was a, a great bonding experience. So the technical aspect was there as well. You try to outdo the other team. Another interesting thing that they mentioned was collaboration. You said that 
these competitions are very friendly and actually you've got competitive teams up top 10, top five, that are exchanging technical tips on how to improve each other's robots, even though they are competing against each other. And that was another lesson that uh, the participants received, as it's not a zero-sum game. So, yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I very much recommend it. I will say that you know, perhaps a robot competition isn't the best thing for someone who does just enjoy playing with robots at home on their own because it is very challenging doing something as part of a group. Yeah. But I think those are all the reasons why I've found it's been a very rewarding thing to be doing with children. And it hasn't just been building robots with physical robotics. It's also been um, introducing them to what I'd call programmatic thinking, mm -hmm. thinking in code. And that's ranged from a couple of products at Scratch or Blockly. I'm not certain which it's called now, but um, the, the visual drag and drop programming language yep. has been a massive, how would you say, a very, very important way to get kids thinking in coding fashion. Even mm -hmm. before that, we had some... Um, B robots that were very simple step-by-step -step programming guides and you can create all sorts of games around that but I think um, Minecraft has uh, yes. perhaps taken over because every child I meet these days plays Minecraft mm. and they're learning programming through it. Yes, uh, I'm going through that very phase with my two kids, uh, Leo and Ari, nine and ten years old, respectively. They are programming Minecraft in Scratch or block-based language. And uh, you know, getting your head around structured thinking, as you said, programmatic thinking. And it's not something easy for most kids at that age, I should say. Uh, you know, their minds tend to float easily from one thing to the other. And the structure that you need in order to get something done in Minecraft is something that takes a bit of effort. But because they enjoy Minecraft, they are willing to make the effort, which is why I think exactly. it's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, these days I tell parents who say, you know, how can I get my child to learn robotics? Yeah. I say, well, just relax about them playing Minecraft, okay? Because, yeah. you know, they're learning robotics. Yeah. Place. So learning through playing, I think that's <laughs> yes. that's something that um, very often we we don't realize. I, I see my kids creating incredible structures in Minecraft block by block, right? It takes a lot of effort. And um, back in my day, my parents seeing me doing that would think that I'm just wasting my time playing on the computer. Now we recognize it as education. <laughs> so, yeah, keep on building. Absolutely. Keep on putting those blocks on. Uh, yes. Andrew, I'd like to, to switch to the US now. So 2011, uh, you make the jump from Sydney to Silicon Valley. Could you tell us, first of all, well, why did you do that? Uh, what was missing from whatever you were doing in Australia at the time that prompted you to move over to the US? And maybe then after that, describe what is happening with Silicon Valley Robotics, which is uh, the company in which you are the managing director? Okay. Well, I think you've really had the scene set in terms of where I come from. Mm -hmm. And so when I was teaching science classes to, you know, my primary school age children, as well as others, I was studying the, um, we called it human robot culture, but it, it was really, you know, looking at the rollout of robotics in society at the uh, University of Sydney. Mm. I'd gone back to do a master's in um, robotics in society. And that was not necessarily a specific degree, but one of the other parents at the school was a professor there, and he was interested in robotics as well. So we used to talk about it a lot. So I just applied to study under his, um, in his department. But I had just been offered what I thought was perhaps my dream job about the best I could do in Australia. I was doing some teaching at UTS and the museum wanted to be doing more interactive robotics technology. And I was thinking, 
that's perhaps the best, you know, I'm not just doing a school program. Mm. I'm putting together all of my thoughts and goals and that kind of artistic leaning to craft whole programs around robotics that would appeal to both children and adults. And maybe I can get in some really cool speakers and, you know, I'll be learning all of the latest things that are happening in robotics because I know all these, you know, great labs and all of this. So that was what I thought my career was going to be in Australia. My husband, who I had met in a robotics lab, as it happened, he is back, <laughs> But he'd taken a what we call the dark side. He'd gone to enterprise software and he was doing research and development for just a big global software company. Yeah. And they wanted the research and development to take a more entrepreneurial tack. They wanted to open an accelerator in Silicon Valley for basically mobile computing companies. And they wanted him to run it. And they said, look, we know you've got a family and they're not going to want to move. So you can run it remotely like, that's going to be fine. <laughs> and he and I talked about that. And first off, we're like, yeah, startups, accelerator. Like, this is all of the new ideas around how we develop technology ideas. There's a lot of this happening in startup culture, which was then still quite a new thing. And flexibility. And yeah, and do you really think that you can do this remotely? And do I really want to leave what might be my dream job and about the only thing that is ever going to be there for a woman who's, you know, going back to the workforce with robotics? Like, there's just not going to be any options for that. But we decided that the opportunity to see what Silicon Valley was like up close was just too good to pass up. Yeah. And the, we'd go for a year special. or so, and if we didn't like it, we'd come back. We kept our house in Australia. You know, we told the kids that we were just going on a trial basis to see what it was like. What became immediately obvious was that it would have been hard for my husband to do his job remotely because yeah. so much of the valley is based around personal interactions. And Things happen so quickly. You know, the meeting that you have on Monday turns into another meeting on Wednesday. And by Thursday, somebody's got a contract <laughs> or a document for something. And that's a pace at which Australia just does not work, you know, for all that we had our first accelerator opening and all the rest of that. So I was plunged into the middle of this. And what I found is that robotics wasn't on anybody's agenda. So I was seeking out the robotics labs that I knew and just saying, hey, I'm just a fan. I'm really curious about what you're doing. I wanted to, you know, understand what's happening and, you know, are you getting investment and how come no one's paying any attention to what's hmm. happening in robotics? Nobody knows and they you. said, look, yeah, we know this is a problem. No one knows that there's robotics in Silicon Valley. So we are creating this organization, Silicon Valley Robotics, and the role of this organization is going to be to tell the rest of the world that, hey, we're here, we're doing robotics. And this is the sort of things that we're doing. And this is how these technologies are going to be useful in society. And, oh, by the way, you know, we'd like investment too, you know, but don't think that it's all happening in Boston because it's not. Like it's really happening right here. And this is a bit of the problem of being the small fish in the very large pond, yeah. whereas other clusters take great pride in saying, oh, yes, we've got robotics, because they don't have as much else happening. Yeah. In Silicon Valley, it was the opposite. What I did, when what I found out when I did the research is that we are the largest robotics cluster in the world. Hmm. We have more institutions and more robotics companies than anywhere else in the world. But yet, everybody still thinks, oh, Boston, isn't that the, uh, the hub place? <laughs> the <main> place. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that's because a few companies have been very, very good at PR. <laughs> you know, they yeah. make amazing videos and everybody's seen the videos. But, it seems uh, like Silicon Valley is connected in our collective memory and perception with Apple, with Google, mm. um, yes. which are getting into robotics, but that's not the main thing that they do. No, not at all. And they're certainly getting into robotics now. Yeah. But one of the things that we found in the early days as well is that a lot of the hiring that they do of robotics people was putting them to work on tasks that weren't really mm. robotics, weren't really exciting. 
either. So, you know, a lot of people got sucked into the big companies and then yeah. they've come back out again. And what is great in the Valley right now is, you know, for my first five years of running Silicon Valley Robotics, because, you know, it was a great idea, but there was nobody willing to spend the time to organize it, get it off the ground and make it happen. And um, so I took that on and it's given me the most amazing um, understanding of where technologies really are kind of crossing the chasm, as it, as the phrase goes, from research into the real world, and where they're still just kind of floundering. There are a lot of things that you see, you know, like somersaulting robots, for example, that are not commercial and that are never going to be commercial. And there are startups that you hear about that are, you know, delivering salad door to door or, or for example, Domino's Pizza, robot drone deliveries and so forth. Yeah, Amazon. They I'm make a lot with. of publicity out of doing that. But that is not a real business. Yeah. It's a well, PR stunt. I suppose um, it's where operating systems were in the 70s and 80s. Uh, there's all these different things coming out in regards to robotics, what they can do, how to make them. But there's no clear direction yet. And I'm, I'm saying that as an outsider, obviously, you've got a lot more experience. Uh, yes. As that. an insider, I'd say there's a pretty clear direction the roadmap is is becoming much better understood, but only, I suppose, when you're on the inside, because what you see on the outside, you're more likely to see these kind of PR attempts yeah. rather than, say, significant sales figures. This is a known problem. I mean, uh, I've had these discussions with the International Federation of Robotics, which is the body that keeps statistics. They keep statistics on sales, so, you know, however you look at it, their information is about three years out of date compared mm -hmm. to the information that I have, which is what are the companies planning to do next, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, we're not seeing significant sales in any of the new areas, but right. I know very well which companies have been funded and how long they've been funded and have they successfully gone from pilots to real-world installations. So they're starting to come up on revenue in a lot of the new areas but it's a slow pathway for many. Can we, uh, since we are an educational <laughs> podcast, mm -hmm. focus on robots in education and maybe draw from your experience uh, running Silicon Valley Robotics to get a feel of where robotics and education play very well together. So as an example of what prompted me to ask this question, I, I was at Edutech a couple of weeks ago and uh, I saw quite a few companies, especially from China, you know, selling humanoid robots. One of them had a, a robot that they tutored as um, your study companion. So like a, a small, like a robot with hands and legs moving, the head moving, and it could make some sounds like uh, good work and stuff like that. Humanoid robots, there were a lot of other robots that looked more like industrial robots, like with an arm able to pick up blocks and rearrange them in different patterns. A lot of that is happening and it's sold in a way or promoted to schools and students. From your perspective, I'd like to know why robots are becoming so popular. So you started working with robots in Australia back in the 2010s mm -hmm. So before that. Uh, where do you see robots going now? What do you think makes a good educational robot? And um, what... I know I've got a lot of questions here, but we'll pick them one okay. by one. Can, can I just kind of come in on that? Because yeah. most of those companies, I think, are a complete waste of money. Mm -hmm. What should we be looking out for, especially teachers and parents? Well, I think that you should look for curricula. Mm -hmm. When I went to Silicon Valley, I found that every second company and engineer was building a, an education robot and or software, and they were talking about starting a competition, but they didn't have curricula. There was no way they could compete with Lego, for example. Mm -hmm. Only one of the companies that I know has succeeded in that space, and they did it by introducing a toy product, more than not. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, two companies, if you count Wonder Workshop, with um, Dot and Dash robots. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, three, if you count uh, Orbodix, who introduced Sphero. And four, if you count Onki. So the four companies that have succeeded in a commercial space that at one stage we're talking about educational robotics have all gone for the toy market. And now they are large enough 
to start to work backwards. So Onki, for example, is now introducing visual coding that converts into Python. And I would thoroughly recommend Onki for teachers. Mm-hmm to work with because they're developing curricula. Otherwise, then I think you've got Lego. But everybody else, they're trying to sell you a product and we buy it because it's accepted wisdom that kids love robots, therefore they will learn STEM. It's kind of like sprinkling sugar on the leafy green vegetables. Mm. And I think it's the wrong approach. We just talked about this with Minecraft. You don't need to kind of do anything to persuade kids to get involved in that. Ditto when you introduce robot competitions. They're things that the kids are enjoying anyway. Now, I have seen no evidence that kids enjoy playing with those humanoid robots. Mm. And I've seen a lot of studies and research trials that I think are poorly done. And I've seen a lot of these humanoids in play areas with no one playing with them. Yes, just so And you I've seen this with telepresence robots as well, which are kind of like robot toys for adults in workspaces. There are a lot of them not being used, okay? So when I run into an educational robotics company, I tell them, look, get out of it. Try and do something different. I don't see any any reason for you to succeed in this field unless you've got a much better game plan than let's just create a new robot because kids love robots. Now, I will say that Obama himself said that robots are the gateway drug to STEM education, We know this, that kids love them, but teachers and parents need to provide a creative and stimulating set of interactions with those robots. So you need to look for a company that helps you provide those. Otherwise, I'm, I'm one of those parents, actually, who has every year I've flooded my kids with science kits that they have then not done anything with (laughs) or that I have kind of floundered. And I realized that it's like a pill. We're taking this magic pill that is going to somehow mysteriously inoculate. It's going to share robotics with my kids. Hmm. And it doesn't work that way. So curricula is the key there. If if you want to use any technology uh, for the purposes of teaching something to students, in our case, when it comes to robotics, it could be engineering, programming, uh, at least those two, there's a lot more you can do with them, then look at the curriculum and uh, ensure that this curriculum actually fits your objectives as a teacher. And if there is no curriculum, then stay away from it. Yeah. And now one of the things that we've seen, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the outbreak of um, interactive whiteboards that was sweeping oh, the schools oh yes. just as I left. <laughs> I remember and that. does anybody actually use them for anything other than somewhere to stick you know, like an ordinary whiteboard? Eventually they got rid of the normal whiteboard, so you have to use them now in a lot of places. <laughs> so you have no choice. All oh, right. <laughs> well, we've seen the same thing starting to happen with every school getting 3D printers. Mm. Now, I've run spaces with 3D printers. They're finicky. They're hard to Mm. keep working, and it's very easy for people to break them. Now, isn't that the perfect sort of equipment to give to schools? I mean, I've also experienced running computer classes at schools, and I spend the whole time troubleshooting um, updates and trying to get them working and get them all on the same sort of software. So now we've just swapped computers that are being now managed in the cloud with 3D printers that require the same sort of commitment to maintenance from the librarian or the computer teacher or the, you know, whoever's basket that one's fallen in. But I will say that the best way to learn robotics is to build your own 3D printer because it's an X, Y, Z axis device, which is really the heart of robotics. It's a robot, yeah. And there's a yeah. lot of kits you can do that, uh, that you can use. Uh, you don't have to go hunting for parts, but you will need to learn about the parts and the principles of operation and program it eventually yeah. to get it to work. And it's a really cool experience to build it. Uh, we always find that, you know, you can build one in, in six hours, mm. but to learn how to design your designs for it, that's an ongoing almost never-ending task, and yet I would say it is perhaps the most bankable skill for the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Isn't coding, it's learning how to do digital design. And 
create uh, physical artifacts out of it. So it's a design that, you know, it still has to abide by nature's laws. When you print it, it's got to be a physical thing that comes out of the printer. So you have to be thinking yeah, about what is possible. it teaches you about whether or not you've got manifold space, you know, yeah. i.e., does your space have a surface? Yep. Or do you have holes in the surface? And how do you how do you design that? And Yeah. And whether your printer can actually do it. So you need to understand what the capabilities for your printer are as you're designing True. it in, in virtual space that essentially has got no limits. So. But even without the production of the physical object, which is a fascinating skill set, just the manipulation of objects digitally, uh, even two-dimensional, it's foundation skills for working in so many areas of computing these days. Yeah. Uh, Andra, at this point, I'd like to switch to maybe one or two almost mm-hmm. final questions. And uh, one of them is that uh, I know that you are the organizer of Women in Robotics, which is a professional network of women who work in robotics. And you've got a, a page for them dedicated. I should also mention that October 9, 2018 is other Lovelace Day. I uh, encourage people to Google or go to Wikipedia to find out who Ada Lovelace is. Um, And I just wanted to say that starting in 2013, you've been creating lists of 25 women in robotics for each year since 2013. So could you tell us a bit about the network and some of the highlight activities that you undertake as part of the network and why is it important? Okay, well, it's a subject dear to my heart, as you've probably gathered. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important because there are so many reasons that women are not an equal part of the computer science and robotics community. And we have to try to fix those problems together on more than one level. It's a complex problem and it requires multiple solutions. So I definitely wanted a part of my job to be in some ways trying to fix that and our um, the robotics community is still very gendered but the women that are in it are pretty amazing and yet what I was seeing was panel after panel largely um, all male Hmm. so at the very least I thought we can try to change that You know, if someone was to ask a computer science or robotics student who the top thinkers in their field were, you know, there was a tendency to go straight to the male names that they remembered. And what I wanted them to do was to go, oh, yes, and Rosina Bakshi did this and Manuela Veloso did this and, you know, Robin Murphy did something else and start to think of all of the women who they might not, see directly in their lab, or to people putting together conferences, particularly large global conferences, to look to women experts in robotics and AI, because we need that kind of high level role model. But we also need role models at kind of every stage. And one of the things that I found happened, one of the first uh, speaker events for women in robotics that I organised, four out of five of the panellists said to me, in fact, no, I think we had six panellists, so it was five out of six of them said to me, but Andrew, I'm not really a woman in robotics. And I'm like, well, you're definitely a woman (laughs) and you seem to be in robotics. So, and they're like, yes, but I'm not an engineer or I'm only a software developer. I don't build the robots or I only build the robots. I don't program them Mm -hmm. or I only develop the research program. I don't build them. And every single one, barring one of the women, who was pretty amazing at both hardware, software, and running her own robotics company, um, she was quite happy to say, yeah, I'm a woman in robotics. <laughs> but, you know, she, she is absolutely at the top of the game. Everybody else, I thought, I would have said that too. You know, I, I'm going to stop apologising and saying, well, I'm not really. And I'm just going to say, yeah, I am. I absolutely am. And I wanted all of these women to say the same thing. I think it's interesting, perhaps, and uh, I'm totally unqualified to say this, but again, as an outsider, it, perhaps um, a trade off uh, human psychology, male versus female, because I was thinking, as you were saying all that, that any male working, for example, in writing software that runs on robots, 
would say that I work in robotics. <laughs> any, any male, perhaps, that is working on uh, the right arm third finger of a robot, of a humanoid robot, and that's all, right? Would say that, yes, I work in robotics. So there wouldn't be much hesitation there, is it? Uh, am I right about I, this? Look, I, <laughs> I agree with that in effect, but I've got a very interesting thing to add to that that I only just mm -hmm. discovered today. You know, it's well known in general terms that women understate their qualifications mm -hmm. and men overstate their qualifications. Yeah. But we see this as some intrinsic or inherent thing. Instead of considering that confidence is a learned skill, And the Harvard Business Review just put out an article on how to keep women in engineering, um, lessons that they've learned from some in-depth interviews over time. And the two key takeaways that they pulled out was that women didn't have confidence because nobody had ever taught them confidence, mm -hmm. given them a stretch project and said, of course, you can do it. I have faith in you to do yeah. it. Whereas I believe that there's a way that we teach girls and boys where maybe girls are given stretch projects in other areas, which might relate to, you know, go and, you know, you, you're more social or you, you can break up a fight or you can write a four-page essay or you can do all of these other things because, you know, yeah. put in our stereotypes about girls. Whereas all of our stereotypes about girls when it comes to robotics and engineering and computer science have not supported them with extra challenges. Yeah. And I've been aware of this through other readings is that one of the things that's lacking in the workplace is equal mentoring. So you might find someone is mentoring, but they will do it in a in two different fashions. The Male intern or student or researcher is given a high priority, a high publicity project, and the woman is given a um, hard yet non, let's say, the shit job. Yeah. And often women end up putting their hands up for it because it's something that has to happen. Right. You know, someone's got to write the annual report, but is that something that's going to advance your career? And It, let's just say maybe they weren't the first to put their hands up. But what this came down to in this report is saying that's actually something that you can balance for. You can provide stretch goals. You can make sure that women keep getting pushed above where they feel comfortable and being reassured that they've got sufficient skills and that the team has faith in them or that right. the mentor has faith in them. So, yes, this is how you learn confidence. And I guess uh, to bring this full circle, robotics competitions is a great place where students, especially girls, can build up the confidence in a technical space, right, that normally it's dominated yes. by boys. So that's another Many great Many of thing. the women in the engineering field that I run into talk about what a good experience they had with mm. competitions, yeah. how it just changed their mind about pursuing technology. Great. Uh, Andrew, I've got one more question before we move into rapid fire questions. And that has to do with your approach to lifelong education and lifelong learning. Obviously, you've done it very successfully. Now, you, you had kids, the kids grew. Uh, at, at a certain age, you decided to go back to university and I totally changed your career and your life since then. So you got some good experience. Can you package those lessons maybe in a couple of items of advice for our listeners? Well, I feel like you have to have a range of experiences to realize the things that you're good at and the things that you want to spend a lot of time on. So I wasn't one of the people that knew straight away this one area. I have been through quite a few different things and I think that that experience has been good. I think these days our life expectancy is getting longer and longer and we ought to be thinking about having several careers, not having one that doesn't change. So to enjoy being curious is, yeah. is the key. So curiosity ensures that you have the, the reasons of why you want to engage in lifelong education. And uh, I, just to, to put my two cents here, I suppose 
everybody's curious, right? As long as you're alive, you're curious. But sometimes that curiosity is suppressed by life. Pressing issues, work, life balance and all that. And I guess we all need to find a way to rekindle and rediscover our child-like curiosity and then there's all these opportunities to act on it. Yes, I think we're very lucky in this day and age that many of us can get that opportunity because I agree, if you're struggling to keep a roof over your head, if your focus is on feeding your family, if you've got traumatic life events, if you're living in a different part of the world where you are under, you know, constant turmoil, then to indulge in intellectual curiosity, I just don't see it's possible. You know, you're going to be exhausted with with the real pragmatic aspects of life. Yeah. But I think that if we get the opportunity, we all have intellectual curiosity, regardless of what our background was. And it doesn't have to, to result in book learning and degrees. Mm-hmm. It just means keep chasing down things that interest you mm-hmm. and keep asking people questions. You know, why do they do what they do? What does it mean? Yeah, don't just settle. <laughs> um, ed- education is actually not easy, right? Th- there is a level of, you know, stressing your your limits, perhaps stressing your comfort level uh, when you are learning something new and something worthwhile. So the reason I'm saying that is like, having a look at a post on Facebook, for example, about something new, it could be like, um, I know, uh, a new form of exercise or a new form of diet and you get a few snippets out of that post, that, that's not really education. You need to get to the root of whatever you are interested about and uh, that is all sometimes stressful, meaning that yes, you've got to try. I, I agree. I think it's pushing yourself and taking some mm. risks. But it doesn't have to be, um, I, I guess it doesn't have to be book-based. I love reading, although, you know, I am quite easily distracted, I've discovered from my reading and writing. But not everybody had enjoyable school experiences. And some of the most interesting people I know express themselves through movement, through um, just uh, loving the biology of the world, you know, and it's quite a tangible thing. They get into the facts and figures through their actual hands-on exploration of Mm -hmm. the natural world around Mm -hmm. us. So I think there are many ways, many pathways. It's a form of exploration. Okay, let's get into a couple of rapid fire questions. So we try to keep those short and very much to the point, and we try to create some actionable value for our listeners. So my first one would be, what advice would you give to educators just starting out now? Wow. (laughs) Uh, Study music? Change careers? No, ask for a raise. People (laughs) don't pay teachers enough. That's, um, hmm. I'd say that's actually a very big challenge, uh, especially like in a public system, probably private would be the same, but, you know, in many of the systems, salaries are in a way fixed um, by laws, regulations and so on. So there might be something that is quite challenging for especially a young educator to be able to do. True, but they, if they feel the passion for education and they're going to do it well, then I think they should know that that is something that is a highly valued skill, at Mm. least in other countries. So recognize your worth, in other words, and uh, you can monetize on it. Well, maybe you'll be inspired to create the movement that changes things for teachers. Exactly. Uh, It's going to be a long road, but it's worth (laughs) one worth taking. Um, Here's another one. A lot of teachers, at least in my experience, a lot of teachers that are tasked into teaching STEM subjects, could be robotics, for example, don't have an engineering or a science background, or maybe if they do, it's, it's been many, many years since they were teaching anything relating to the new STEM curricula that they're called to teach. How do you boost your confidence in a situation like that? You play with the technology yourself and you come up with a fast answer whenever someone tries to, um, how do you say, 
whenever someone wants to get into what is basically a pissing contest about what mm. your background is, and people come at this sideways and they say, so when did you, you know, what kind of engineering did you do? <laughs> and there's this implicit assumption that you have a degree to be teaching kids robotics. Yeah. It's not that hard. You know, we're expecting 10-year-olds to do it. You know, we can mm. all master that skill. Yeah, yeah. So I think the key thing is also deflect people who are questioning your competencies. You know, you don't have to apologize or say, well, yeah, I'm not really an engineer, but I just thought I'd step in and run the robotics club because no one else was doing step it. Step in, that's important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, um, and I think play, play with, one of the things that I'd love to have done was set up adult classes for parents who kept saying, oh, yes, but I don't know how to do this. <laughs> and I'm like, no, let's all get together and you're going to compete against your kids. Okay, maybe. That might have been too challenging. <laughs> Especially for today's kids, yes. That, that would be challenging. Uh, those kids today are very clever. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I find that STEM teaching is really not technically challenging, right? Um, it is, however, it is very challenging in terms of the right using the right educational methods to help essentially the students to teach themselves, which is a, also a big component of what STEM education is all about. So m maybe uh, when people ask me about that, I say uh, just be less of a traditional teacher. Okay, concentrate on your method rather than the, the technical aspect of the curriculum, which you can master easily anyway with a little bit of play uh, as if you were the student himself or herself. Yeah. So. I found that the flipped classroom model, and again, I have not trained as an educator, barring as a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've done several courses in coaching, but I have not done any teacher training. So what I'm told that I ended up doing with the kids coding class was a flipped classroom. Mm -hmm. So I had printouts of everything I wanted to teach them and they got thrown in the bin. I spent the whole time running around, troubleshooting, turning computers on and off again and finding <laughs> the file, that kind of low-level stuff. Yep. Meanwhile, the kids that were fast, they'd already ripped through all of the beginning exercises and then they were into tweaking their um, scratch backgrounds and then it became this viral effect. Everybody would cluster around someone's computer and say, oh, how did you do that? What does that look like? And then they'd race off to their computers and they would do something else. So I think uh, we were founding that in Robotics Club as well. The kids would go on YouTube and they would find other kids doing things that they wanted to copy and do themselves so that my role became not about teaching them but about mopping up any problems, making sure that they had everything that they needed there and being able to, you know, answer, you know, very specific technical questions yeah. rather than yeah. anything else. They so true. <laughs> so true. And I find that, at least in, in my work as a teacher, I teach online a lot of people, I find that most of the questions come from people that are just starting up now and they may be a little bit confused about, you know, elementary basic things and probably the same thing is in classroom. And once you help them get past the beginning bits and pieces, they're off on their own and they can tweak and, and make changes that you did not expect. And very soon they just surpass, surpass your knowledge and they're off on their own doing amazing things so maybe we need to come up with a new name for teachers maybe i don't know facilitators or something like that mentors or who knows but i think the name teacher is is changing um at the moment becoming something different to what traditionally a teacher was meant to do yes i think you're very very right there yeah, I've got one more question. It's a bit more technical. Uh, you are a high-tech person with robots and uh, Silicon Valley and all that pretty amazing stuff. Are there any applications or perhaps a specific application that uh, you're totally depending on? It could be as simple as a I think well, robots are going to be critically important for agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, key problems that the world faces is that we have ageing populations almost everywhere in the world, and that means that most farmers are within five years of retirement age. Mm -hmm. And we need to double the world's food production. Even if the population is not doubling, it's probably going to be going from 7.9 billion to 10 billion in the next mm -hmm. 20, 25 years. And those are all people that don't 
accept starvation anymore. They don't just want food, they want food with protein. So we have a high bar these days for the sorts of foods we need. And, you know, there is no more arable land left. We've yeah. put cities on it or there's already farms on it. We can't um, really deforest any more areas and they're not as suitable for agriculture. So this is one of the areas I focus on. For me, it's a, a critical global human problem and we're going to need a range of technologies to help solve it. Right, yeah. Interesting you say that because oh, we we know, a lot of us know about the vertical crops in places like Tokyo downtown. <laughs> We've got high-rise buildings devoted to mm-hmm. agriculture. I was reading on the New Scientist that actually the increase of forest-covered land has been increasing for the last couple of decades. And in aggregate around the world, there are parts of the world where forests are being lost, but uh, there are those areas seem to be compensated by increases in forest-covered areas in other parts of the world. And as you said, technology and robots in particular seem to be a key of feeding our ever-increasing human population. And I was um, in my makers club on Facebook, uh, there was one person that mentioned and linked us to a new robot that actually allows crops to be grown without pesticides. So the robot would go around and uh, somehow, I didn't read the article, but somehow it's going to um, clear the crops from pests uh, could be things like uh, bugs for example on leaves and things like that so without using chemicals so thanks for that <laughs> that's i think that's something a uh, robots in agriculture an area where people don't really associate with robots we think oh, of absolutely. self-driving cars yeah. industrial and robots do you know that there are a few different methods that robots can use to get rid of weeds that include lasers Yes. and microwaves just and <laughs> just boiling water. Yeah. So there are some non-fungicide um, yeah. things that I find quite quite uh, interesting. But we're seeing a lot of attempts to get robots out into the fields, uh, including in animal care and management. And University of Sydney's got a good uh, robotics field centre, so does QUT up in Brisbane. And certainly a lot of... Um, work in Europe, particularly where they're doing a lot of funding for agricultural robotics. And, you know, what I'm seeing here in some of the agricultural regions, but we haven't yet solved a lot of the problems in that, you know, there's one or two robotics that are looking successful at the moment, and there's a lot that are still trials. And there is a lot of focus on this area. So I would hope that in the next two to three years, you'll be seeing a lot more articles about, wow, this dairy farm uses a robot to do this and this wheat farmer can use a robot to do that. And that's going to be turning into actual productive value producing robots that are commercially available. That's that's totally awesome. Like uh, I say that robots will save the world, right? Not take over the world. It's just a very positive, uh, you know. Yes a very positive thing to be happening to coming out of uh, engineering. Uh, so Andra, if, if you don't mind people getting in touch with you or connecting with you, what's the best way for them to do it? I know that you have Twitter and Facebook accounts. You also have email. What's your preference? Uh, email is perhaps the best, but, you know, certainly see what I've got on the, the website at Silicon Valley Robotics. I'm just mm-hmm. updating it now. And, um, Yeah, I'm very happy. I especially love getting in touch with Australians who are doing something in robotics because, you know, there are a few of us over here in the valley, but uh, we always like more. Absolutely. We're going to have those details on the show notes for this episode. So, Andra, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's um, eye-opening in in many parts. And um, I wish you all the best with Silicon Valley Robotics and with the efforts that you are uh, are doing uh, in regards to getting more girls into sciences and robotics in general. I I think that you are, well, there is success already, both in your efforts and the efforts of a lot of other people. So good luck with all that. 
Well, thank you very much, Peter, and it's been a pleasure. Bye thank now. You. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode. The notes for this episode that include links to many of the resources mentioned and information on how to get in touch with Andra are available on our website, techexplorations.com forward slash pay forward slash STEMiverse. Each episode comes with its own page on the Tech Explorations website and a gold mine of information in the notes. This STEMiverse podcast episode was produced by Tech Explorations. Do you have any questions or suggestions? Would you like to nominate a friend or colleague to be our guest? Please email us at pa at texplore.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, STEMiverse. That's S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you again next time.